Well, let us go there, and I'm going to be dealing with, again, this whole question of the rich man and Lazarus. We need to keep in mind this is a parable from our Lord to teach about his kingdom and about the realities of the kingdom. And yet it is a parable. It's designed with some elements of it that are true and others put in place in order that he might make a point concerning the kingdom. And so we're coming to the intermediate time frame of this series and we're going to be looking at the next few verses today in order to move toward the completion of what the parable itself is all about. If you will, Luke 16, 19 through 31. Here we have the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is confronted and comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. Nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Meaning they have the law and they have the things the prophets preach to Israel. They have the truth already. It has been spoken. It has been written and recorded. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. I like this text in particular here because sometimes I hear young students call me and say, you know, I don't have anybody who's really reformed to talk to you where I'm at. And, and I like to call if I could sometimes to talk to you. And I say, fine, I don't mind doing that. But do you have any kind of a library at all? Oh, yeah, I've got something. And they'll tell me the books they got. And I'll say, you know, I'm never alone. I can walk into my library and I've got Calvin sitting there just begging to get off the shelf. Matthew Henry, John Gill, those men want me to pick them up and talk to them for they have much to say in what they have written. And they think I need to hear it. I'm never alone. Here, our Lord says, 
you got Moses and the prophets. If you got that writing, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, I love this, they will repent. Well, I, I think if they, if you would meet somebody that you know has died, been buried, I don't think repentance is what's going to be your first action. First, you're going to probably yell because you're startled. Then you're going to have more than like or some kind of excrement coming out of your body as you're running. Repentance isn't the first thing on your mind. I'm not even sure it's the last thing on your mind. Escape and hide would be your biggest thing. And our Lord tells him, that's not going to matter. They're not going to repent. Listen to what he says. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rise from the dead. The miraculous is not going to change people. It's just not. They will discount it one way or the other. The pragmatist believe many people have died and come back to life. Have you ever read any of those books? I read five or six of them. Life After Death. Wasn't written by a Christian, written by a bunch of pagans. We believe that there is some kind of spirit out there floating around when the body has passed. And we believe that sometimes the spirit comes back and the people come back to life. So much so that they say the resurrection of Jesus was not something supernatural or miraculous. We see it and hear about it all the time from people. I was floating around over the operating room, realized I had died, and then I was put back in my body and came back to life. And I came back from the dead. Well, when you read the word of God, you know that is a, a load. Of you know what? Because the Bible says it's appointed a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. He doesn't come back unless he comes with Christ. Because he's a believer. We commanded to believe those that have been sent to teach us. That in the day of the resurrection, the only one who died and came back to life in history, outside of Christ calling some, or God calling a few to demonstrate his miraculous power, in the book was Christ himself. And it was he that was raising them. For he is the second person of the Godhead by his spirit. God, the Son, who indwells that physical body. He's the one who is doing the work of bringing forth the resurrection. And so it is. He says something very careful to them. It doesn't matter one comes back from the dead. They are not going to hear him. They are not going to hear him. You are hearing the word as I read it. You are expected to act upon that word. There's a part of your life. This parable is for you. Where are you in relationship to the calling of God? Are you hearing Moses, the prophets, and the apostles? Are you hearing our Lord in his life as he's teaching us? How are you responding to it? Well, we made it very clear this parable was given by the Lord with the conceptual background for the concept of a parable in the New Testament being a Semitic 
understanding, not Aristotelian at all. This parable is focused upon the kingdom of God and the unrighteous use of money, of selfishness, and the final estate via the judgment of man for his misuse of the things God has given him, but more than anything, his misunderstanding of his duty to respond to the Messiah. This is, once again, our Lord, as I said in his brilliance, weaving the doctrine of the law of God and of the prophets into a theme on the kingdom and its gospel. Man must not trust in his own abilities. He must not trust in his own wealth. Thinking that he has been blessed by God and his wealth somehow is that mark of God upon him that he is good and one that is obedient and is a follower because good things are happening to him. When in reality, the providence of God uses those things given by him as a means to a final judgment that was not realized until it was too late. Condemnation falls. And you have that. In Luke 6, 16 through 17, the beginning, just before the parable, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone who is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one title of the law. The law is going to stand. It will never change. It doesn't alter. It doesn't make allowances. It doesn't say, oh, you know what? Don't worry about this. Go ahead and do it. It's okay. God has it as a standard of judgment. You pass here, you're condemned. You don't get your two hundred dollars, and you don't get your I get out of jail card. Don't work that way. Break the law. You need Christ. Don't turn to Christ for your redemption. You will be judged. Everything you have done, and you will be cast in the pit of hell. Well, let's turn our attention then to the next few verses concerning the rich man, a man of wealth, and Lazarus, a man which has no means or wealth whatsoever. This is the parable illustrating a principal truth about. Christ, the kingdom, the kingdom of God, and how it works for you. We pick up at verse 23a. Here our Lord says, And being in Hades, the abode of the dead without Christ, having lifted up his eyes, being in torment, he doth see. Now here we're getting some information about the location and the condition that's taken place after judgment. Listen to it. For the Jews, by the way, Hades represents the place of torment. It represented a place of death. It was a place also known as hell. Yet they are people who are alive in them. Your body may be in the grave, but the soul which lives, that which you think with, that which is your real personality and character, not the flesh, continues to exist in perfect form. Now, I'm a great illustration for this. My soul and my thinking and my morals and my concepts are all there. Though I have only one eye to see out of today, Though I have a broken arm, I got a tooth missing, and I've got neuropathy and can't hardly feel anything from my knees down. The body is broken, but the soul functions quite well. 
understand the abode here of the rich man and Lazarus is their souls. It is the soul that thinks. It is the soul that continues to think after death. It is the soul that can feel torment. You say, well, how can it do that? Well, I really don't know. He doesn't tell us how that is. He says it is. But I have an idea. I believe our God can literally put within our understanding, our thinking, all those torments so that they are an actual reality to us. We are tormented. I don't think there's any greater torment than to know the truth and not have done the truth. To know there was a way of redemption and you didn't take the way of redemption. The parable begins to talk about that. All of a sudden, the rich man wakes up and he died and he's in hell. And in the parable structure of this, the Lord says, he looks over to the other side. Truthfully, that can't be done. But for the purpose of the parable, it's important that the parable be told in this way. And so it is. It demonstrates the idea for sure that these people were capable of thinking, of seeing. Let's look, if we could, just a little closer at this. In the teaching of the Septuagint, which is the translation of the Old Testament in Greek, Hades is essentially identical with the Hebrew term Sheol which means the place or abode of the dead. The term shell in itself has no doctrinal principle of blessing or punishment. It never says. Acts 2.27 tells us, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Here the word shell in this is a reference contextually to the promise that Christ would go to the grave. That's where it's being used there. That's its context. And that he will not remain in the grave and his body will not experience corruption. Revelation 20.13 says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades were delivered up, the dead who were also in them. This is the resurrection. And they were judged, each one according to his work. There is a day coming when all men will be resurrected to stand for the judgment seat of Christ. Here you have the intermediate state. They're dead. They some died in sin and were buried in sin. Those bodies are going to be resurrected. What's left of them? Now, that's hard to understand to some extent. I understand. Because if you had a shark come along and you were just put into the ocean, he probably ate you. And then, if he didn't pass you out, he may have been eaten by another creature, a whale or something, and digested and spit some of it out in a little fish you did. You might be all over the ocean. But the Lord says he can resurrect you out of the ocean. The power of our God is just unbelievable. You and I couldn't put that guy back together if we tried. We'd say, where do you start? This guy's been passing through so many fish. All we got left is this gooey stuff. And yet our Lord can put it all back together. That is amazing, isn't it? It is really amazing. And they were judged, each one according to their works. The intermediate state of their soul is either in Abraham's bosom or in Hades. But there is a day of resurrection coming and a day of judgment. Praise God. Day is coming when we will be able to flee from this broken down body. Now, if you're young, that really didn't make a whole lot of sense to you because you haven't experienced what the older 
Christians in our church have been able to experience. Lose an eye here, lose an arm here, have this fall out, your teeth fall out, you're, you've got all kinds of problems going on in your life. I mean, you're just falling apart. You're young. You know, when I was young, I could take on the world. I was nothing going to happen to me. I could live. I could survive anything. I'll tell you now, I can't survive what I'm going through already right now. It all changes in time. It's a state of mind, but not the state of the actual body. Needless to say, there's a reality that's coming someday for you. And for those of us who have gone to that point of reality, it's hard. And we look for the day when we will be taken with our Lord. And we will be raised up, given a new body. I'm going to get one that's about six foot three, 240 pounds. I look like a uh, an anvil, just great looking. If heaven has a football team, I'm the running back. What a day to be resurrected. To be restored. Do we not look for that? Is that not a great hope that we have? Well, here in Luke 16, 23, we're informed that this Hades is the place of punishment for the wicked. The New Testament developed, development of this should be noted. And the only test in the Old Testament, there is only one suggestion that is that there is a variety of eternal destinations. It doesn't get too particular beyond that. However, when the Lord Jesus Christ brings life and immortality and life into the Scripture, He reveals both eternal gain and eternal loss to us. For example, 2 Timothy 1.10 says, But has now revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, thus Hades or Sheol cannot struggle this, cannot struggle this advance connotation. According to the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery by Brower and Eliot, they state this, and, and I'm going to read. It's going to be a little bit long. I don't normally use a long quote, but they so well said it, I could not find a way to capture it in a shorter kind of a, um, a, a melted down understanding of the idea. So I'm just going to read it to you. The best known biblical image for hell derives from a deep, narrow gorge southeast of Jerusalem called the Valley of ben Hinnom, Hinnom, in which idolatrous Israelites offered up child sacrifices to the gods Moloch and Baal. You can see this in 2 Chronicles 28.3, 33.6, Jeremiah 7, 31-32, and 19.2-6. Josiah defiled the valley to make it unacceptable as a holy site, 2 Kings 23.10, after which it was used as a garbage dump by the inhabitants of Jerusalem. As a result, the valley of ben Hinnom became known as the dump heap. <coughs> that is, the place of destruction by fire in Jewish Now, the Greek word for hell is Gehenna, which is commonly used in the New Testament for the place of a final punishment, which is derived from the Hebrew name for this valley. Robert and Elliot go on to state this, and again, here I will quote them at length. This valley was also regarded as an appropriate image of hell due to its association with the place to deposit the bodies of those slain in battle by God's judgment. Jeremiah prophesied that the valley would be 
used as a mass grave for the corpses of the people of Judah killed by an invading army. Jeremiah tells us that in chapter 7 and in the most of the passages of Scripture, but more in particular, you see it in verses 30 to 34. Prior, they said, association of the place with cultic abominations, the exposure of the bodies to carrion eating birds and at the carnivorous, they eat dead flesh and animals and the uh, unceremonious nature of the burial indicated that the dead lie under God's curse. That's how it became known in, in, in the time of Israel. They continued in stating this. Isaiah mentions an unnamed place near Jerusalem in which the bodies of God's enemies lay under God's continuing curse. Their worm will not there where the worm will not die, nor where their fire will be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Jesus' depiction of hell in this text brings together those prophetic images that were taught to Israel. We see this, for example, in Mark 9, 47 to 48. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes and to be cast into hellfire. Where there the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. How horrible would this be? The sight of mutilated corpses, bones of dead humans, maggots, flies, carnivorous animals, and eating off of dead bodies, flesh that is smelling of the rottenness and the burning of such flesh that is also taking place, all conveying to anyone who would see it that sense of horror and revulsion to those who would be living. No one would really want to go there. It's not a place you take your vacation. It's not a place you want to go see. You hear of it, but you hope to never see it nor experience it. It is not a place of fun. It's not a place that you can go on sinning. It's not a place you can drink alcohol until you're inebriated or do drugs or that you're going to sit around and play cards with the devil and his demons and then maybe chase a few women on the side. Not at all. All the people who die in their unbelief will go into the unquenchable fire. Jesus calls it the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. But if you do not seek out Christ, that will be your final abode. This is why Peter says daily, make your calling election sure. You better be sure where you're heading. We still have a remnant of sin left in us in which we still find ourselves violating the law of God. You better make sure you're not living with unrepented sin and thinking somehow just because you signed a paper or you said a few things or made a prayer, that's it. There is fruit of the Spirit in the life of the believer. There are good works that come forth from that redemption. In Matthew 25, 41 then he will also say to those in his left hand, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There is where our Lord says that. Matthew 25, 41. That's not where you want to be. I'm telling you, you cannot imagine this place of torment. Jude in verse 6 through 7. 
And the angels who did not keep their first estate properly, their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Isn't that interesting? That in Jude, he identifies those who chase after sexual immorality, but he also includes those who go after strange flesh. He's talking about homosexuality. Their place. Unless you're going to rip chapters out of your Bible. And believe me, the liberals have already done that. They only have a couple pages in the Bible at the point. They've tried to change everything. They've tried to rewrite it all. They've tried to say, this does not apply anymore to us. That was for this day. We don't live under this time. That's not what the scripture teaches us. These are eternal decrees of judgment by God. Ever. And this is what you're seeing with the rich man in Lazarus. One is in the bosom of Abraham, as it is said. The place where those who are followers and are faithful to the will of God, trusting and believing in the Messiah, this is where they go. They go to the place of comfort. It's not really in the same place of the abode of those who are judged for the judged people will never see again the people of the kingdom. And the people of the kingdom of God, those who follow Christ, will never again see those who were judged. Those things will be behind us. We, more than like, will know that there was a judgment. But we will not see those who are judged. And we will not live in the past in our minds. They will Sin will be wiped out. But those in hell, they'll know. I had the opportunity to trust Christ, to confess Christ, to believe in Christ. I had the opportunity to give my life to Christ, to live for Him. And here I am, not in the abode, eternal blessedness with God, eternal peace. I'm in a place of eternal torment. We have got to make sure that we do not become like the Jews and miss the calling of God. Not only to Christ, but to the life that we live in Christ. We are Christians. It means we're little Christ. We are to live the way he lived. Act the way he acted. We will struggle all of our life. Jason said it so well. Are you at war with these things? Mortification of sin, which is the negative side of sanctification, is putting sin to death. We have to work at it all the time. You'll struggle with it. That's your battle. That's the cross you will bear for Christ. You've got to go to war with sin and then you have to put on Christ and His holiness and the good works and the fruits of the Spirit. Walk according to the standard of righteousness, which is the Word of God. And so I exhort you today and I challenge you. Are you at war with sin? Are you assured in your life today your final stop, if you die right now, it's going to be heaven and not hell. I got news for you. If you're not trusting in Christ, and if you haven't confessed Christ before man, demonstrated your repentance, the newness of life that you're going to live by faith, and start seeking to honor and live for Him. You have new goals and new desires and new want-tos in your life. You 
going to miss the mark. You're going to find yourself like the Jews. Don't be mistaken in this. Because you're born in a Christian home and considered within the visible covenant, that is not a rubric to allow you to think you've got eternal life. It is the context from which you will be called Christ in the preaching and teaching of the gospel because you are in the covenant family. You need to look to Christ. You need to be angry with sin. You must see that it offends our God when you do wrong, when you violate his law. It's a hard thing to do. It's a war. We can win the war. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world fighting against him. He will see us through to the victory. That's the assurance. Do you believe him? Do you trust him? Are you living for him? That's the real question that the rich man Lazarus has to bring to us. What will be your final bow? Abraham's bosom? Or shall it be place of torment, hellfire, shale, Guyana. Where are you going to be? What will be that eternal state of your soul? Shall we pray?